Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. Uh, we are joined today by Professor Tyrone McKinley Freeman, Associate Professor of Philanthropic Studies at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, IUPUI. He is joining us today to talk about his wonderful book, Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving, Black Women's Philanthropy During Jim Crow, published by our friends at the University of Illinois Press in 2020. Of Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel are Given, our friend Tiffany Gill writes, there is no simple story of Madam Walker's charitable giving. Instead, by spanning the course of Walker's remarkable life from the daughter of enslaved parents to beauty culture mogul, Tyrone McKinley Freeman's brilliant and impeccably researched book demonstrates that wealth did not drive Walker to give, but she was an embodiment of a much longer, though often hidden, tradition of Black philanthropy. The book will forever change the way we understand Walker's importance and provide such a needed context for contemporary calls for economic justice. How are you doing today, Professor Freeman? <laughs> I'm doing good, Professor Neal. Thank you so much for having me on today. You know, there's a way in which, um, because she has come up so often, particularly in this Black history moment, of like, you know, because she was the first. So Madam C.J. Walker name comes up all the time and because of the hair care products, you know, folks think that they know <laughs> Madam C.J. Walker. Um, the depth of uh, that you present and, and broadness of who Madam C.J. Walker is in this book is, is fairly extraordinary. I mean, it's, it, it is such, you know, as Tiffany said, such a wonderfully researched book and really fills a tremendous gap that we didn't know there was about our understanding of me, Madam C.J. Walker that not only fills a gap about Madam C.J. Walker, but as you talk about throughout the book, this, this much longer tradition and different tradition of philanthropy, you know, as it exists historically in the Black community. Um, talk a little bit about what brought you to Madam C.J. Walker. Wow. Well, um, what brought me to her was, um, you know, like like many people, you know, I learned about her and other uh, great figures in our history through church. Right. That, you know, the, the Black History Month plays and the Mother's Day plays and all that stuff we grew up having to do and all these figures that you learn about. And so um, so she and others have captured my imagination from, you know, from being a young child. And so years later, um, you know, when I entered into the professional field of fundraising, um, you know, where I was regularly the only African American in the room, um, you know, I found myself in a, a field that really didn't understand Black philanthropy mm -hmm. or Black giving, but coming out of the church, coming out of the community, I was raised in that tradition. Everybody around me gave, though they didn't use that word philanthropy. And so, so as I began doing my own studies, uh, Madam Walker presented the perfect opportunity to begin to not only uh, approach her in a different way and understand her differently, because we tend to focus on the commercial, the, the millionaire, the business, that sort of thing. And then we say, oh, yeah, she, she gave to charity too. I wanted to know what, the, what, what, what that meant to her and where that came from. So it really was kind of this combination of my own lived experience um, mm -hmm. growing up in the Black philanthropic tradition, my experience as a professional fundraiser, uh, and you know, a scholar having deep questions about the motivations, origins, and evolution about philanthropy by and amongst Black people. I mean, for a moment, I mean, your own trajectory is, is interesting, right? Because we think about Black folks working in uh, the giving space. Um, you know, before I read your book, I had no idea there was a school of philanthropy. <laughs> okay. okay. Right? As, <laughs> as an example of that, what was it like for you making that transition from being a professional fundraiser, you know, to, to looking at it from the, the viewpoint of a scholar? Yeah, um, well, it was exciting because, you know, I have been in the room with donors and been kind of cultivating uh, their awareness and their engagement around important issues and negotiating gifts. So I knew all about those dynamics. And that left me with a lot of questions about why people give, how they give, what drives them to do that. And then again, but coming from my own community, knowing that I was surrounded by generous people who were constantly giving, but never once thought of themselves as philanthropists, more likely to say that they're just doing the Lord's will or 
or just giving back, hooking people up, doing things, you know, in the community. Um, I really, that, that's where kind of the nexus came for me, an opportunity to explore these questions that came out of my own experience. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, the, the, my field really values that connection to practice um, and tries to bring those questions into the research and then in turn, bring that research back out into the community. And that's what I hope to, had hoped to do with this book. You mentioned that, you know, when thinking about a figure like Walker, you know, folks are apt to try to compare her to her contemporaries, mm -hmm. um, white male philanthropists, right? And, and the comparison, you know, fails for a bunch of reasons. Right. Um, white women philanthropists who might have existed in that point in time, and, and you make a very clear distinction, you know, there's a difference between inheriting wealth and in the case of someone like Madam C.J. Walker, someone who created wealth. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that distinction. Yeah, um, during Madam Walker's lifetime, kind of the, the the philanthropists that historians return to time and time again are folks like Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, these magnates who made money in steel and oil, um, and and really their approach to philanthropy has really kind of set the model for 20th century giving and even today. So when you think of people like uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, they're kind of modeled after this Carnegie approach to philanthropy. This idea that you spend your life accumulating wealth and then later in in your elder years, um, you, you become focused on philanthropy. And so the first thing is, well, wait a minute, this is not what Madam Walker was doing. She wasn't waiting. Um, you know, she began giving much earlier in her, 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 her life. And I point out when that starts and she's kind of this young mother in her 20s living in St. Louis and becoming a part of, of Black St. Louis there and becomes engaged through her church. And so then we get to see kind of giving and engaging and resisting, becoming a part of her everyday life. And it, it's something that grows over time. And so that by the point time that she does become wealthy, now she merely has more resources to put in service to things she's already been doing. So that's a fundamentally different model than what Carnegie was doing. It, you know, you opened the, boy in a, the book with uh, her clap back to Booker <laughs> T. Washington, <Yes. laughs> who's like, OK, I appreciate the gift, but, you know, we want more. And, and she literally has to educate him, you know, about, you know, first of all, you can't turn down any gift. Um, and, 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 you know, she names it. I'm not like your white supporters. Right? That's right. She tells it to him straight. This is something that's a little different. And, you know, one of the things that, that you draw out in that, particularly later in the book, is that, you know, very often we think about Black giving in the traditional sense of it, right? It's always about giving money to people and things that you might not have contact to. Um, with and, and you mentioned just in your comments a few minutes ago, you know, black folks have a practice of giving to people who are in close proximity, right? Kin, yes. fictive kin, yep. actual family, but we never think about that as being, you know, philanthropy, right? And right. and Walker had a habit of really supporting those entities and institutions that were closest to her, right? Yeah. Both in terms of her lived experience, right? But also had the kind of impact on people that she knew. Right. Yes. Both in terms in, in, a, in a metaphoric sense, you know, in terms of being poor, formerly enslaved, working class, I mean, all those kinds of things. And then mm -hmm. institutions that she actually had relationships with. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, every gift that she gave was one she once needed herself. Right. And so she yeah. she you know, so she's very much um, driven by a sense of what the struggle means, uh, a sense of what Jim Crow took away from her um, and how does she try to provide this for others. So she becomes very much invested in education and supporting schools, you know, Mary McLeod Bethune School, uh, mm -hmm. Charlotte Hawkins Brown School. Right. So because she knows, you know, Jim Crow denied her an education. She's very much attuned to black social service agencies agencies um, and, and the work that they're doing. And so that, that proximity is so important because it informs that giving. And it also informs the nature of her relationship with those people and those organizations, because we don't see the same kind of paternalistic um, attitudes and approaches that we do see with Carnegie and Rockefeller and the ways in which they interacted with Black colleges and other organizations that receive their funding. How important was the AME Church to Madam C.J. Walker in terms of her development of, of a philanthropic model? Yeah, uh, very important. Um, it, it, it's important because um, I, I mentioned before, so when she um, she arrives in St. Louis in 1889, a young mother, her husband has, has uh, died, um, and she's trying to get her feet, you know, trying to get established. And so she becomes connected with St. Paul's African Methodist Episcopal Church, which still exists to this day. Um, and, and, and the women in that church um, embrace her. 
Um, and these women, they're, they're kind of that, 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 that uh, the club women, the church women, they're running the auxiliaries, the might missionary society, they're building orphanages and social services to help the arriving black migrants that are coming to St. Louis on their way heading westward. And so there's this philanthropic social safety net that's that black people created. And Sarah, young Sarah benefits from that. And it's, it's women, uh, there's one that I point out, Jesse Batch Robinson, who was a leader in that church, right? And she kind of takes young Sarah under her wing. And so Sarah gets to see her as a part of NACW and dealing mm-hmm. with Jim Crow in St. Louis. And so very much modeling notions of respectability and, and, and racial uplift. Uh, and, and so we see her kind of adapt, adopting these practices. And later in life, it, she reports that it was during that period where she became serious about giving and understanding that she had a responsibility to others. So she very much was socialized into this by the women around her, which makes a lot of sense since our parents usually teach us this, but she was an orphan. Traditional notions of philanthropy often focus on money, monetary gifts. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You really push us to rethink that in terms of the Black tradition, right? Where voluntary yeah. service, right? This, act, this idea of voluntary action for public good was particularly important because Black folks didn't have the same kind of material and financial resources, right? So they found other ways to give. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how that, you know, that theme runs through not only Madam C.J. Walker's, you know, life and career, but also the broader practice of Black philanthropy. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the Black experience shows us that the, the quote unquote three sectors of society all conspired in our oppression. So obviously, mm-hmm. government, you know, supported slavery and Jim Crow of uh, the private sector locked us out of opportunities and locked us into menial labor, but also the nonprofit sector, which is supposedly about helping people is complicit, whether it's universities and education, uh, hospitals that wouldn't take us in. So we had to create Black hospitals. So we're in this situation where we have to create our own. And so the post Reconstruction period period is this period of massive mobilization and institutionalization. Black people are creating institutions and funding them in many cases themselves. And so Walk, this is the context for Walker's evolution as a giver. And what I wanted to ground her in, rather than this pedestal that being a millionaire places her on and seems to distance her from the communities that produced her. And so I try to show the different communities and people who were giving. And this notion too, that again, it's not just money. Money's important, don't be mistaken, but it's not just money. And that's why, you know, there's five chapters in the book and each one is named for a different kind of gift that mm-hmm, she gave. Mm-hmm. And even those gifts challenge our definitions because I start talking about activism and opportunity, economic opportunity through the company. Right now, there's a lot of people who talk about social entrepreneurship and should businesses have a double bottom line, the financial and the social. Well, in many ways, Madam Walker is doing this, um, you know, a hundred years ago because her company, she envisions as a quote unquote race company uh, in that racial uplift, race man, race woman trope. So, um, so there's lots of things, lots of ways that she's pooling her resources um, and, and using them in service to the struggle for freedom. I, I wonder how Madam C.J. Walker would have functioned in this technological moment. And, and I say that because uh, the women who worked for her, the Walker agents, uh, are really an early version, analog version, if you will, of social media influencers. I mean, that, that's that's really the work that they're doing. And there's a way in which even now in 2022, even though it's like a billion dollar industry, mm-hmm. we think of the beauty industry as something that's frivolous. Um, mm. You know, you will hear some folks even critique, largely men, <laughs> you know, that 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 black women's focus on those aspects, the hair and the makeup and all these kinds of things, right, are mm-hmm. somehow emblematic of a desire to look white. And I mean, you know, all the critiques and critiques that were made yeah. of Walker yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and hair products during the day. Um, but the thing that you critically talk about in this book is that, you know, she made the beauty industry a viable industry and option for working class black women Mm -hmm. right to get them out of kitchens to get them out of people's houses um she herself right as a washerwoman i i I smiled when you know you talked about carter g woodson you know memorializing the washerwoman right and how important the washerwoman was as a social actor in black Mm -hmm. life you know in in post-slavery and in those early years of the 20th century You know, how important was it for Walker to claim this alternative space for Black women, particularly working class Black women, to be able to make a living, to have a job, to feel proud, both in the sense of how they could look, but also in being productive in terms of the labor force? 
Very important. And I totally agree with you. She would totally be on TikTok and Instagram and doing all those things, man. <laughs> She'd be leading the way. <laughs> um, no, this is critical. I mean, and this is here. This is where, I, you know, I'm indebted. We're all indebted to people like Tiffany Gill, who's shown, right, what, what beauty culture as an industry did for, for the struggle, right, and how the women uh, were actively engaged. And so Walker, you know, recognizes these, these opportunities and she'll, she creates these economic pathways for Black women. So as you said, they can leave the wash tubs and they can provide for their families and engage the struggle at the same time. And so for her to set up the company and you could be a sales agent, you could be traveling. She also had this setup where she would help incubate a salon for you. So there's, mm -hmm. I, I show some of the stories where she's investing in shops for people so they could get going. Um, you know, there's just many different pathways that just weren't, weren't, weren't around. And so it becomes important. And, and then uh, she knows the power of women. So she says, hey, we need to be in Walker clubs and it's not enough to sell these products, we've got to be doing something for the struggle. And so the, the agent club clubs becomes a platform for them to engage in issues like anti-lynching and women's voting rights, as well as providing charitable support and social services um, in the community. Uh, you mentioned the Walker clubs, uh, which was something yeah. that, again, was really illuminating to me. I'm not a Walker scholar. Um, but the idea that, you know, she had set up a mechanism um, to be able to do the kind of social justice work that was important yeah. modeled in some ways on black fraternal organizations, but also, you know, going, putting her own different kind of spin on it. Um, and again, when she's meeting, having that national meeting and she's talking about the 1917 St. Louis riots, the race mm -hmm. riots, um, mm -hmm. a really striking different image of Madam C.J. Walker than the one that we've been historically presented to her. Right. Um, both and I, I mean, that was also my feeling about her relationship with the AME church, right? Because, you know, we don't think about her in the way that we think about Black women's, the Black women's club movement and Black respectability <laughs> politics of the moment, right? And she was able to move herself and her uh, Walker clubs into that space yeah. and really push those spaces to be much more proactive and be much more militant, right? In some of their, in some of their, um, language about talking about what was happening with race relations at the time. Yeah, I mean, she, she has this amazing ability to cut across and move across these class differences. And so if we think about young Sarah being a part of St. Paul's AME Church and seeing all these club women and NACW women, you know, engaging, well, young Sarah wouldn't have been invited into that circle. But later, Madam Walker is welcomed with open, open arms, right? And so her achievements become this proxy to give her access to it. And she, so she's simultaneously able to engage the, the quote unquote middle class club women and the working class women who are, who are her agents and, and, and kind of working across those lines and engaging. So I think, you know, it, it's a very important example of some of the, the, the conflict that Deborah Gray White has written about amongst the club mm -hmm. women and others. Mm -hmm. And Walker is, is navigating that in ways as staying connected to both, both uh, um, you know, groups um, and able to kind of push both forward in, in again, in dealing with some of the leading issues of the day, anti-lynching, women's voting rights, et cetera. Booker T. Washington is a, a mentor and a hero figure to Madam C.J. Walker, but yeah. also a competitor. Yeah. Um, she yeah. really wants to remake the idea of industrial education through the beauty industry, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and to do a different kind of work that, that Booker T. Washington was doing at the time. Um, you talk a little bit in the book about two things. One, the relationship that she had with HBCUs, right? HBCUs yeah. who, who are interested and invested in trade education. Um, she begins to reach out to HBCUs, right? To create Walker models mm -hmm. uh, among mm -hmm. as part of the curriculum at, at HBCUs. Could you if, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so she began reaching out around 1916, 1917. She began reaching out um, to Black colleges and, and offering them these opportunities, saying, hey, let, what, what if we partner together and, and you provide my curriculum? I'll give you some money. You can set up the labs and everything you need to do that, and it'll help you kind of train your students, and then they can come work for me, or they can go out and hang their own shingle and do their own thing, um, but I'll, I'll provide this funding and we can get things going. And, and there was, there's, there's four or five uh, schools that took her up on that offer 
offer um, and began to offer these curriculum. Mary McLeod Bethune is one who thought about it and had several conversations with her about it. Um, it didn't last long, at least based on uh, existing archival evidence. Um, but again, it speaks to this notion of, of kind of partnering and working across institutions um, to try to not only grow this market, she's obviously trying to grow her labor market, but she also knows the independence that this brings for women and, and, and able to use industrial education in a way that really is kind of cutting at, at Washington's model, because Washington, on the, on, on the one hand, is telling Black folks, hey, don't go to the North. There's nothing for you there, right? right? right. But, but he's like, stay here in the South and do this agricultural thing. And Walker's saying, hey, here's this pathway into these urban Northern industrial economies that, right, where you can go, you can hang your shingle, I'll invest in a salon for you, or you can work for me, and you can build a different pathway for yourselves. And the Walker schools continue into the 1970s. There's incredible um, uh, yearbooks and, and catalogs and things in the archive where you see, you know, just this hundreds and hundreds passing through places like Kansas City, Dallas, Chicago, Pittsburgh. Uh, and so it becomes this important provider and the credential is, expect is respected and helps to grow uh, beauty culture as a profession. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the thing I think it's also critically important, right? You know, what we know in terms of what marks people coming into the Black middle class, if you will, mm. in that period of time, is, like, is to be able to claim to have some sort of credential, right. a teaching credential, you know, an MD, you know, something that names you as a professional, you know, in ways that you didn't necessarily think about it before. Um, even the fact that, you know, you talk about the pushback of some of the, the washerwomen, right, who, mm. who essentially are unionizing on their own terms right no one called it a union right but but they're, but they're working collaboratively with each other right to be able to set prices for all households so, so so no one gets undercut you know by someone who's an outlier in this context i mean it's really an extraordinary way to think of how walker takes you know what we think of as the the lowest rungs of black life and and uses the theory of how those people survive Right. In order to build her Walker empire. Right. And to create opportunity for so many other folks. Um, one of her visions, of course, was to, to build the Tuskegee of Africa. Right. right. To, to be able to take Walker into Africa and build out there. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, the, that particular vision from Madam C.J. Walker. Yeah, so she she names this at um, uh, the meeting of the National Negro Business League, where she, you know, kind of commandeers the floor from Booker T. Washington after he denies her the opportunity to speak, but she feels like she should be able to speak just like anybody else there. And at the end of this kind of rousing speech that she gives, she, she asks the audience to join her in her greatest ambition, which is to build the Tuskegee of Africa. And so this notion of kind of going international, uh, we know that during this time is when she starts traveling, goes to Cuba and other places. And so this kind of this Pan-Africanist consciousness is developing for her. She's beginning to make connections uh, to the Black struggle for freedom in a global sense. And so there also, I think there's there's tinges of, of the AME church there who was doing a lot of missionary work right. and building schools and, 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 and churches on the ground in South Africa. And so um, while that vision never materializes for her, um, it's something that she made provisions for in her will. She left behind money uh, for that institution to be built. But her daughter, later on as executor of the will, went to court and had that struck out because she didn't know how to do it and wanted to focus on other things. But it, again, it, sp it speaks to this growing internationalism for Madam Walker, that value of education, her respect for Washington and what he was doing, but also her trying to push that envelope. Walker dies at a relatively young age. Um, yeah. What do you think her trajectory is if she's able to live a longer life? Um, what does she individually achieve and, and what do you think Walker products you know, are able to wow. achieve if, if she's still there to maintain the vision for it. Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, well, well, later the company really struggles during the depression. So it would have been interesting to see how she might have handled that. Did, yeah. yeah, right, right, right. Um, uh, you know, uh, she was, I mean, she was really on that upward trajectory, um, becoming more and more well known. Her wealth was increasing. Her right hand man, Freeman B. Ransom, a black attorney, was, was desperately working to be a good steward of the resources and help to grow those for her so that she could have the things that she wanted. Um, I think she would have become increasingly international. We know the work of Keisha Blaine and others about this mm -hmm. period here where internationalism mm -hmm. is taking off and Black women are a big part of that. So she definitely would have been a part of those uh, uh, conversations and activities. Um, I, you know, I, I, 
I am, I, who knows, man? It, it would have been something. It would have been something <laughs> for you as a as a historian in this in this mode, as in, you know, going through the archives. Yeah. What were some of the challenges that you face, you know, trying to recover records and things of that nature to tell this story? Well, you know, so Walker's unique in that her 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 papers are very well preserved, and there's lots of them um, at the Indiana Historical Society, uh, which we owe in part to one of her employees who had a lot of stuff in the basement and turned them over, right? Is that that's our story, right? Um, but but the the institution has been a very good steward of those papers, so a lot is there. And so for me, it was really the, the challenge of how to look at them how to make sense of what her giving was and what it meant and what she was trying to do. And so this is where, um, uh, you know, Africana studies and Black women's history and, 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 uh, and frameworks from these uh, fields are very helpful for really mm. to draw out the role mm. of club women, right, um, and, and their, their connection to philanthropy, um, engaging the role of Black entrepreneurs in history and the ways in which Black businesses have been put in service to the struggle. So it's really kind of bringing those things together to construct this lens to see Walker um, and then to make sense, because there's lots of receipts and things like that. The transactional aspect of giving is there, but I wanted to push deeper and go beyond the gifts and saying, look at the broader array of resources that she was bringing to bear and what was informing these and where did it come from? And that's where these connections to the club women so important, to the church is so important, to black business is important and, 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 and other, other important aspects of our history. Yeah, two other questions about the archive. Um, yeah. You know, what were things that you found in the archive that absolutely surprised you, that, that you were shocked to be able to find it? And, and what things in your archival, you know, research didn't make it to the book, um, mm. you know, for whatever reasons? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, so one of the things, um, uh, but the relationship between Walker and Ransom, uh, again, he's this black attorney um, who becomes her her kind of company manager, and he uh -huh. leads the company after her her daughter dies. Um, it, they have a very, very special relationship. And I didn't know what to expect going into, but when looking at their correspondence and looking at the things that he's doing on her behalf and the nature of their conversation, they had a very open relationship, which may be surprising for the gender dynamics of the era. He really saw himself as this steward of her, this protector in many ways. He's trying to keep unscrupulous characters away from her, which was funny because in the, in the Netflix series, there's all these street hustlers that are kind of very right. close to her, giving money to them, right? That, like that Freeman Rand was making sure that stuff wasn't happening. Right? So, so, so the nature of their relationship is something that really surprised me because in the letters, there, you know, there'll be the, the, the financial things, the business transactions and what we need to do. And then there's a very much this kind of deep emotional connection. Their families are deeply bonded. Even to this day, the Ransom heirs and the Walker heirs are very close. They grew up together here in Indianapolis. Um, so that relationship was, was something that was, was very pleasant to see and was surprising how deep it was and how Ransom continued to, to raise up, raise her up and, and carry her story um, into the future. And he, he didn't die till 1947. And he remains this kind of ride or die for Madam Walker uh, throughout that time period. So I would have written more about Walker and her giving to the arts. Um, okay. She supported uh, Black artists. Um, there's a couple of painters and sculptors in Indianapolis that she supported. Wow. Uh, there was a harpist that she supported. And it's very interesting because when we, we do write and think about Black philanthropy, we're thinking about it usually in terms of, of the struggle for freedom and, and right. funding schools and supporting those kinds and, of things. And, indigent but, populations, right? Yes, yep. indigent <laughs> populations. But she was very keen to the arts, very keen about how we were being presented, very keen about developing uh, artistic expression um, mm -hmm. and value that and when we look at the ways in which she adorned her mansion um, and the interior design in very detail so i think there's something important there uh, about the role of arts in the evolution of black philanthropy that i would have liked to have delved in more you do present a a kind of uh closing argument um about madam cj walker and, and the existence of the walker yeah. products as they still exist to this day um, yes. Talk a little bit about the most recent history of, of Walker products. So currently, so they were actually just re-released through a new yeah, line that's being that. offered <laughs> through Walmart um, to make it accessible <laughs> to uh, to the public. And so the, the, the backstory uh, is that um, there was a company called Sundial Products that um, people will know from Shea Moisture, um, mm -hmm. where the, the owner uh, purchased um, the Walker company and then relaunched it through the brand and it was sold through Sephora. Um, and 
And then um, recently they transitioned out of that and have developed this new incarnation um, that is now being made available through through um, Walmart. So it is something that that is here. And the interesting thing is that when when Walker's family um, sold the company in the 1980s, there was a local family in Indianapolis, the Randolph family that that purchased it and, and maintained it for some years. But again, the industry had changed so much. Right. Um, it didn't have the national profile anymore. So so the Walker company technically has never gone the way. Um, it's had a few different owners over the past 30 years, um, but but it's, it's it's now been relaunched and, and is, is, is trying to stay connected to its, its tradition of engaging and meeting the, the beauty needs of Black women. What can contemporary Black philanthropists learn from the model of, model, of Madam T.J. Walker's life and the legacy that she leaves? Yeah, um, well, one, I, I hope that they can learn and see their own connectedness to this deep history. You know, Black philanthropy did not start with Robert F. Smith and Oprah Winfrey. If we want to start with a monetary definition, right, it goes back to the beginning of our experience here that Black people have always given of themselves, cared for each other, looked after each other, and all of that is philanthropy. We limit our understanding of philanthropy to financial transactions because of tax policy, right? It's 20th century tax laws which tell us what we can and can't. Um, deduct from our taxes. But the reality is philanthropy is this kind of ancient human practice. So it predates these things. And so in our tradition, it's important to uncover this notion of, of philanthropy and Black generosity and how it has been an important thread in the ongoing struggle for freedom, because it's how we cared for each other on the slavery plantation, in the free Black communities, and on in today. It, 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 whether it's in you know the links, the, the Divine Nine, the churches, the mm -hmm. mosques, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, the, and now the the, the new incarnations of giving circles, which are an emerging form where people are pooling resources together. Black people, Black women in particular, are flocking to giving circles. And I think because it's familiar. It's what the church women and the club women have historically done, what the fraternal orders did. You paid your weekly dues and they paid social insurance and burial insurance out of that, right? So, so giving circles become a new manifestation of that. And then we see people of, of more means, high net worth people engaging family foundations and donor advised funds, which are philanthropic tools um, that people can use to, to, to leverage their giving. So I want them to be grounded in that history, to take pride in that, because the public conversation is very much focused on white tech billionaires and what they're doing or what they're not doing. Uh, but, but we've been philanthropists from the beginning. Many people are claiming that on our behalf. Um, and, and, and I hope that, that everyday givers from this community will, will be connected to that history and be empowered to give from it because the struggle yeah. unfortunately continues. Yeah, I mean, one of the deeper points that you make throughout the book is that we always presume white philanthropists to be the givers and and black folks to be the receivers. Yes, <laughs> and, yes. and this this book goes a long way to challenging, you know, that kind of mindset, right, to give us a kind of alternative view of what was actually happening on the ground. Uh, what's next for you, Professor Freeman? <laughs> Wow. Well, thank you. Um, I have, um, you know, doing this work on Walker um, really challenged me to think about, well, how were the men thinking about these responsibilities and these activities? So, so the, the investigation I'm doing to look at some, some uh, Black men and their, their connectedness and, and understandings of philanthropy. And also, I want to continue this work of building bridges between my field of philanthropic studies and, and, and Africana studies, that I think that there are important things that, um, you know, what I'm trying to do with this book is simultaneously challenge my field to think differently about philanthropy. Yeah. And also right. Africana studies folks, because I know also we, we tend to write about philanthropy, again, as something that white folks were doing to us. Um, we, we develop other frameworks for thinking about these kind of indigenous practices of giving that we've developed. But I want to connect that to the, the, the philanthropy conversation. And so yeah. I think that there's a lot that Africana studies can teach philanthropic studies about how to study and value Black people and, and, and excavate their lived experience for, to gain understanding about philanthropy. And I hope that there are things that, that Africana studies scholars and Black women's historians and others can learn by thinking about philanthropy a little bit differently and using it as a way to engage. Because you go into what, what you go into the archives, you'll see you, your, your figures you're studying. They were given to church. They were on committees. They were they were in these groups. There. What did that mean? I want I want to want to ask Africana studies and you know and scholars in this space to think about what were they doing? What what did that mean? What role did that play in their life? And how does that connect? That that's what philanthropy is, and, and I think it can add something powerful to the research agenda and to our understanding of the Black experience in America and the world. That is great. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, remember reading David Levering Lewis's classic when Harlem was in vogue mm. um, 30 years ago. And and one of the figures that he talks about doing the Harlem Renaissance is a black runner, uh, numbers runner by the name of Casper Holstein, okay. um, who actually gives, you know, money towards the first opportunity prize. <laughs> 
and, and, and it blew my mind at the time because, again, you know, not only was it, you know, black folks committed to philanthropy, but, you know, this dude basically was a, you know, a corner dude. <laughs> right? Yes. You know, an upscale drug dealer, right, who understood the value of giving to the arts. Um, so, again, you know, exactly. I think it, your, your book is following in a wonderful trajectory and, and tradition in that regard. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I mean, and, and you see this in hip hop today, right? What rappers have entourages, right. which are their boys from the neighborhood, right? They're which trying they're to give an of. opportunity to, right? right? And they're, they're they're paying that for that. They're paying for the hotels and the right. flights for them because they know they're safer on stage with them than back on the corner, right? That's Absolutely. part of that, that those extended family networks. That's part of this tradition too. Absolutely. We've been joined today with uh, by uh, Professor Tyrone Freeman, Tyrone McKinley Freeman, Associate Professor of Philanthropic Studies at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Man, that's a mouthful. I know it is. I know it is. (laughs) (laughs) Who who is the author of the important book, Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving Black Women's Philanthropy Doing Jim Crow published by the University of Illinois Press 2020, of which Tiffany Gill writes, this book will forever change the way we understand Walker's importance Mm -hmm. and provides a much needed context for contemporary calls for economic justice. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Freeman. Thank you, Professor Neil Zanano. Thank you very much. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.